introducción del tema que nos platicará hoy el, el profesor, este, no sé si todos ubican estas compañías, este, si conocen un poquito pues, cuál es la historia, eh, qué es lo que les pasó, si ven algo en común, y, y, y en resumen, pues a final de cuentas son compañías que en algún momento fueron muy, muy exitosas, fueron líderes en su mercado, líderes, líderes en, en su industria, pero eh, pues pensaron que eh, si el, el mismo modelo de negocio les había funcionado en el pasado, pues no habría que cambiar. Eh, no, 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 no tuvieron una visión, digamos, eh, a largo plazo, no se pusieron a pensar en lo que pudiera venir en el futuro, en reinventarse, eh, se resistieron al cambio y bueno, pues ya todos sabemos este, qué, qué es lo que pasó, ¿no? Precisamente la transformación digital lo que busca es evitar que, que muchas de las empresas pues tengan un, un desenlace como los que tuvieron estas, estas compañías. Eh, ahora, este tema de transformación digital, que seguramente todo el mundo pues, lo ha escuchado en publicaciones, en medios, en sus respectivas empresas, y es un tema que está muy, muy de moda, pero ¿qué es realmente la transformación digital? La transformación digital es una serie de, de conceptos, de herramientas, de tecnologías, todos de, de innovación que probablemente en sus compañías están incursionando en, al, en algunas de ellas. Estamos hablando de eh, eh, soluciones de movilidad, eh, soluciones en la nube, eh, eh, marketing digital. Ahorita las redes sociales están ganando un auge importantísimo en, en todo lo que tenga que ver para entender pues, cuáles son las necesidades que tienen eh, eh, nuestros clientes. Eh, el tema de analíticos, ahorita eh, con toda la cantidad exponencial de información que tenemos en las diversas bases de datos, cómo realmente le sacamos provecho y seguramente también han ido a hablar del concepto de Big Data, bueno, es precisamente a través de soluciones de analytics. Cómo extra, podemos explotar toda esa información, a final de cuentas, pues, para tomar decisiones. Este, eh, análisis predictivos, omnicanilados, o sea, es una serie de conceptos que todas, a final de cuentas, engloban eh, pues, lo, toda la tendencia que hay ahorita en el mercado eh, respecto a transformación digital. Ahora, ¿cuál es el camino eh, 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 que recomendamos las empresas de consultoría como nosotros para abordar eh, la transformación digital? Y, y típicamente eh, pues, no, es, no es una fórmula específica, no es una receta, eh, en la mayoría de los casos, pues es un traje a la medida dependiendo de las necesidades de cada empresa, de la industria, del tamaño, de cuáles son sus objetivos estratégicos, pero siempre tiene que partir de, de una estrategia, una estrategia hacia dónde quieres llevar a la compañía desde el punto de vista eh, digital, eh, definiendo objetivos, objetivos muy declarados desde la alta dirección, que pueden ser temas de rediseño de negocio, transformar modelos operacionales, eh, optimización de procesos, etcétera, y siempre con un enfoque, eh, y en la mayoría de los casos es un enfoque centrado al cliente, a final de cuentas la mayoría de las compañías viven para sus clientes y desde ahí es donde debe partir toda la estrategia de transformación digital. Y a final de cuentas eh, esto tiene que tener eh, eh, metas este, muy, muy claras, metas a corto, a mediano y a largo plazo, llámese crecimiento en el mercado, eh, aumentar las ventas, bajar costos, ser más productivos, eficientes, entonces esto simplemente lo que nos da es un panorama de eh, no cometer el error de a veces empezar a, a implementar soluciones o conceptos o, o porque los hemos escuchado o porque la competencia los hizo, siempre tiene que estar muy, muy, muy alineado, pues, al final de cuentas, a un, a un plan estratégico. Bueno, y en, en, en UBAG, eh, como les comentaba al principio, pues al final de cuentas, dentro de las capacidades eh, que hemos desarrollado en, en los años recientes, eh, ¿cómo podemos ayudar a las empresas en este camino de transformación digital? Pues principalmente estas son nuestras eh, eh, líneas de servicio o, o especializaciones. El primero es eh, Business Intelligence, al final de cuentas es eh, cómo ayudamos a las empresas a tomar decisiones, decisiones estratégicas, tácticas, operativas, este, eh, temas de analíticos que lo comentaba en la lámina anterior, temas de planeación financiera, consolidación financiera, cómo a través del el análisis de los diferentes indicadores eh, pues se pueden tomar buenas decisiones. ¿no? Y herramientas hay muchas en el mercado. En, en, en UAG tenemos experiencia pues, con las principales, eh, eh, llámese los SAP, Epicor, Oracle, ClickView, Power BI, Tableau. Hay muchas herramientas. Ahí lo que nosotros buscamos es ser muy agnósticos. No, no somos una empresa que vende licencias. Lo que buscamos es, dependiendo de la necesidad de cada cliente, pues hacemos la recomendación o cómo ayudamos a maximizar ya la inversión que hizo 
la herramienta al adquirir eh, cierta tecnología. ¿no? Eh, la segunda línea de servicios, que precisamente el nombre que tiene es transformación digital, porque ahí es en donde engloban muchos de los servicios ahorita que los clientes están demandando, eh, mucho tiene que ver con los procesos que tienen eh, en contacto con nuestros clientes, temas de marketing, temas de procesos de ventas, de servicio al cliente, típicamente lo que se le conoce como soluciones de CRM. Tenemos capacidades muy, muy interesantes que hemos adquirido en diversas industrias para ayudar a las empresas a eh, implementar este tipo de, de soluciones. Y eh, también otro tipo de servicios o, o soluciones que han tenido mucho auge en los últimos años es cómo ayudamos a las empresas a generar eficiencias a través de la automatización de sus procesos usando tecnología. Esto básicamente son, son robots, el concepto se llama RPA, Robotic Process Automation, en donde en los procesos de administración, de finanzas, de recursos humanos, comerciales, operativos, eh, eh, el robot se convierte en un asistente digital que prácticamente va a ser muchas de las actividades pues, que un usuario hace en el día a día, o actividades muy repetitivas, de mucho volumen transaccional, pero pues un robot pues las hace, en lugar de hacerlas en varias horas, pues las hace en un par de minutos, ¿no? Esto te genera eficiencias muy interesante y es mucho de lo que nuestros clientes nos han demandado eh, recientemente. Eh, la parte de aplicaciones empresariales eh, principalmente es nuestra capacidad en implementación y soportes en RPs. Igualmente tenemos eh, experiencia en SAP, eh, en, en Oracle, en Epicor, que digamos son los principales RPs en el, en el mercado. Eh, la parte de normativa y cumplimiento, eh, más que nada habla de cómo ayudamos a las empresas a que desde eh, eh, el apego a ciertas metodologías, eh, llámese eh, ISO, eh, para temas eh, de, de, de sistemas y TIL, COVID, pueden adquirir mejores prácticas para brindar buenos servicios eh, dentro de sus empresas. Eh, la parte de software, pues simplemente es las capacidades que tenemos en desarrollar software a la medida. Eh, pueden ser desarrollos en ambiente web, en soluciones eh, eh, de dispositivos móviles, que era uno de los conceptos que veíamos al principio en transformación digital. Ahí es donde tenemos esas capacidades. Y por último, muchas veces los proyectos fracasan o no alcanzan sus objetivos por una mala gestión. En, en, en UBAG tenemos consultores especializados, eh, certificados como PMPs por el, por el PMI, eh, que brindamos pues, esa asesoría a, a nuestros clientes para llevar una correcta gestión de, los, de, los, de sus proyectos. ¿no? Eh, y por último, esta es una frase que, que me gusta mucho, eh, de, de Jack Welch, el ex CEO de, de GE, que habla de cambia antes de que tengas que hacerlo. O sea, necesitas anticiparnos a que a lo mejor si no lo haces tú, alguien más lo va a hacer, la competencia va a ser, eh, eh, hay que hacerlo en el momento pues, antes de que sea eh, pues, muy tarde. ¿no? Entonces, este, pues, quedo a sus órdenes este, y bueno, le cedo la palabra aquí al, al profesor este, Jeff. Perdón. Ah, adelante. Este, eh, cualquier duda sobre la compañía, pues aquí vamos a estar después de la conferencia para atenderlos. Gracias. Gracias, Patricio. Me voy a permitir leer una breve semblanza del profesor Tauso. Jeff is a private equity investor, Peking University professor, best-selling author, and keynote speaker. His, his writing and speaking are on digital China and on Asia's latest, the most important technology trends. Nicknamed China's celebrity professor, Jeff is the number one followed professor in China, more than 3 million followers in LinkedIn. He was also the number one LinkedIn top voice for finance globally in 2017, and number three for China overall, 2018. He was also named one of Alibaba's 15 global influencers, 2017 and 2018. Jeff is a frequent speaker at companies, boards, conferences and universities around the world. He has been seen on CGTN, CBS News, ABC, and other programs. His investment advisory work in, is in healthcare, primarily in the US and China, Asia. Jeff was previously head of direct investments for Middle East, North Africa, and Asia Pacific for Prince All will it, nicknamed by Time Magazine as the Arabian Warren Buffett. His latest books are the One Hour China Book and the One Hour China Consumer Book, 
both were and are Amazon's best sellers. Jeff lives in Beijing and Las Vegas. He's a huge fan of Starbucks and anything Marvel. <laughs> and as an ex Burger King employee, he claims he can make a hundred hamburgers in an hour. <laughs> Welcome, Jeff. Okay. Can I take this off or how does this? Uh, good. Thank you. There we go. Is that okay? Okay. Good morning. Thank you uh, for the invitation. It's been a tremendous pleasure. Patricio, thank you for supporting this. Am Chan, it's been a, a real pleasure. I, I, I've spent a lot of time in Mexico, but this is my first time to Monterey. So, as I've been saying repeatedly, you're all spoiled. It's too nice. It's beautiful. The food is amazing. You're all spoiled. I, I, it's, um, it's too good here. Uh, I thought what we would, I would talk about is sort of what's going on with digital China as it relates to other parts of the world. Because one of the interesting things that has happened, oh, what did I? Um, I mean, this is technology. It's technology interacting with business, which we have seen over and over and over historically. This time is a little different because for the first time, we're seeing the leaders in technology are not the most economically developed or wealthy countries. In fact, we're seeing less developed countries, which China is, the GDP per capita is about one sixth of the US, is leapfrogging the wealthiest countries. And I don't know if we've ever seen that before started in China, now we're seeing it in Southeast Asia, we're starting to see it in India, where technological advancement doesn't seem to be going hand in hand with economic wealth for the first time. It's really interesting what's happening. Uh, that's the background. Um, I can make those hamburgers in an hour. I can totally do it. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is, I won't go through this, but just this is my old boss, for those of you who follow news. There's a guy in the Middle East called Al Walid who is sort of the worst person in the Middle East. I was his sort of slave for many years. Uh, we won't go into that. And I've been taking students out to meet Warren Buffett for the last couple years. So going there after this in uh, next week for the big annual event, which is, he's a big fan of China. So is his partner, Charlie Munger. They talk about China all the time. Um, this one I just put up as learning advice. Um, learning sort of advice. If you ever get a chance to take a picture with Mr. Buffett, this is not how you do it. <laughs> so the next year, I literally pushed a student out of the way. Like <laughs> it was my least dignified moment as a teacher ever, but I did get the photo. Now the truth is this young woman pushed me out of the way. So it all comes around. Okay. And this is a little book we wrote. Uh, we wrote this book about how to understand China for people around the world. We sell it for a couple of dollars. It's not a, a money thing, but for basically busy people around the world who want to know a little bit more. I think it's like four dollars or something. It's not. That's Beijing Peking University. Skies are not that blue. Um, okay. So I'm just going to make a couple points. Um, now I've given you here 140 slides because that's fun for me. But um, I'll give you a link at the end. They're all up there. I'm obviously not going to go through them. But if some part of this is interesting to you, download them. But also the caveat is don't get mad at me if I flip through them, because people always get mad at me. I couldn't read it. You know, I just didn't think it was worth going through. But they're all up there. So uh, if, if part of this is interesting to you, there's more you can read. But really, I just want to make a couple of points about how digital in China is somewhat different. And this applies to Asia, and I think it applies to a lot of developing economies. Um, first point is China is unique in that we have a huge number, which everyone knows this, everything's big, of consumers who are really what we call digital first. They, they operate entirely from a digital perspective. Um, 
and we don't, we don't we don't see a critical mass of people behaving like this anywhere else in the world. Uh, and because of that, businesses are responding to them. Every business is having to respond to the fact that these people are digital first consumers, and not just in China, but all over the world now. Um, so the first point, I won't stand in front of you. Um, one of the, the natural results of this is everything is better on a smartphone. I have a US smartphone I keep in this pocket, a China one here. Everything on my China phone is better. Communications, media, e-com, it's all better now. It's not just a little bit, it's getting a lot better. Uh, why? Because there are 1 billion plus digitally enthusiastic consumers in China, and this is what they want, and everyone's serving them. Uh, they are always on. All day long, they're on their phones. Uh, mobile payment is universal. You can go into any store, click on your phone. I can walk down the street, someone <coughs> selling fried pot stickers with a little walk on the side of the street will have a QR code. I pay that way. Beggars on the street will put up a QR code and you send them money. After dinner, everyone argues who's going to pay the bill with your smartphone. Uh, mobile payments universal. Everybody uses all the channel. Like the center of digital China is the smartphone. Now that's different than say the US where you would talk a lot about enterprise level things. Um, the enterprise level manufacturing in China is actually slower. It's the consumer side that's racing ahead. Um, and one of the results of this is you get a huge amount of data because they're always on. Data is sort of the oil that makes all this go. So there's a nice cycle between consumers and generation of data. This is a standard chart. I won't go this. Look, there's a lot of people in China. They're all on their smartphones. 700,000 internet users, 800,000. This chart is a little better. If you look at internet users by country, this is where you get this critical mass of people who are digital first. And you don't really see any other country with that many. It's that critical mass that's sort of shifting things. Their behavior is pretty much driving everybody else to respond. If you're going to sell anything in China, you have to do digital and you have to do social media. It's the only way to reach people it's through their smartphones. Well, it's the required way. So if you talk to companies like Zara and Budweiser, they all say the same thing. They say their digital marketing teams in China are the frontier of their whole company globally because this group is having to run like crazy and the rest of the companies watching them. <laughs> Uh, cheap and fast delivery is normal. Uh, if you order something online, it's expected to be here today or tomorrow. That's normal. They think it'd be like 11, 11. If you order by 11 at night, you get 11 the next morning. If you order 11 in the morning, you get it that day. And if you order food, it's 15 to 20 minutes. It's just expected. And if you don't offer that, people get pretty annoyed at you pretty quick. Um, and mobile payment is pretty much the norm. If you go into a lot of stores, they won't take cash anymore. So here's an example of this. This is Singles Day, which is the big Alibaba festival that happens every November 11th. Uh, it's basically a big shopping festival on people's phones. Um, and this is the media. There's a big gala. And they have pop stars and all this stuff. And down the street, there's a big media center. This is the media center down the street. This is when it ended. So that number basically says in one 24 hour period, they sold $30.8 billion worth of goods in 24 hours. These are all press, <laughs> like 800 press covered. It's crazy. Um, now, they're not the only, so all these businesses are responding to this behavior and it's not just there of the companies that participate in this big day. There's about like 150,000 merchants participate, probably 60,000 of them are around the world. They're not in China. So merchants, people who sell avocados in Mexico participate in this, uh, tequila sales are crazy. Um, there's merchants all over the world are learning to respond to this consumer demographic. Oh, and by the way, you have to deal with them digitally because that's how they engage. So this, this respond to Chinese consumers, it's far bigger than just China. Um, there's a lot of interesting quirks. When you, when you live digitally, things are developing a little bit differently. Um, E-commerce is increasingly about content. 
uh, writing articles, influence. Influencers are incredibly powerful in China. They're more than celebrities. If you want to sell something, you don't hire a celebrity. You hire an online influencer with a big following who sits there and talks about, here's the Haddon bag I got in Mexico. And you know, a million of them sell in a couple hours. So there, we have these online influencers. We have reviewers. We have content. Um, local services like delivery and things are a big deal. Um, like I'll give you an example, like you go out with friends, you drive your car. You, if you've had a drink, you do not want to drive your car because the, the standard is if there's any alcohol in your system at all, you're over the line. It's zero. So what you do is when you're out with your friends, then you pick up your phone and you use an app and you, you basically do a local service app and a person comes up on a scooter, folds the scooter, puts it in your trunk and then drives your car home while you sit in the back. That's a, that's a popular service. We have breakfast here. Somebody leaves their smartphone. We're across town. You call up. A little messenger will come, pick up your phone, and drive it right over to you within an hour. That's a popular service. There's all these little local services that are emerging uh, because of this behavior. Then there's a lot of crazy stuff, too. Um, these bicycles, which you can now see in Mexico City, that's a Chinese company. That has a lot to do with the fact that everybody's walking around with a phone that can pay immediately. So you can walk up, snap the bike, pay it, hop on, hop off. Uh, these are drones. This isn't really happening. These are delivery drones. These are kind of in, I don't see these much. You see them on business campuses moving around. You don't see them on the street yet. These are KTV booths, karaoke. <laughs> this is the subway. You get on the subway, you walk up, you click with your phone, the door opens, you sit there on the stool with your buddy, microphone, you sing songs, and you can broadcast it. It's a social media app where you invite people to watch you sing. <laughs> and there are people who do this as, as influence who have big followings, and it becomes like a group behavior. This is the subway in, in Beijing. This is the airport in Beijing. If, you, if it's raining, Carrying an umbrella is, a, is annoying because you have to carry it all day. You get off the subway, you walk up, you scan your phone, you unclick an umbrella, you take it. When you come back to the subway, you click it back in and you go. There's all this stuff like this happening all the time. This is a fresh juice machine. This guy's buying for his two daughters. This is pretty popular. You, you squeeze, it squeezes the juice fresh, and then you see these guys on little scooters coming up with big, huge amounts of oranges, and they pour them in the top. This is a new one. This is where you buy and you don't know what you're getting. <laughs> it's like a prize, like who knows what we'll get. And you pick and they're all the same. This is my early morning thing. My first thing when I get up, actually the first thing I do when I get up is I turn on the phone and I check the pollution. The second thing I do is I press my coffee button and within 15 minutes a scooter guy comes up and hands me this and I get my little coffee out. It's a dollar for delivery. Do it every morning. It creates a huge amount of waste is a problem. Um, this is my new favorite. You know the game where you, you do the claw and you play? This is a claw live lobsters. <laughs> so you do the little thing, you do the claw, and you drop them in, and then you put them in the bag. This is in Beijing. Um, anyways, the point is, be, once you get the critical mass of consumers on their phones digitally first, it enables all this other behavior that's just popping up all over the place. Because suddenly you can do things. You can hop on scooters. You can buy lobsters. You can... It enables a lot of type of commerce outside of, hey, I'm going to the store and buying something. Um, and this raises this interesting question, is what happens when you see these sort of big jumps in consumer experience and productivity in a country that is still developing? Most of the shopping is not Walmart and nice malls. It's little side streets with primitive retail. What happens when you get this sort of bump in an, I mean, it's different when Walmart competes with Amazon because they're both hyper efficient. This is like Amazon competing with little mom and pop retailers with the, you know, 
what happens when that happens? You basically get a huge bang uh, for your digital dollar. Um, and the most important thing, and this is sort of point number one, is because the infrastructure for the country is not really in place yet, the infrastructure that's being built is built for a digital world, not for the old world. So you're getting superior infrastructure to support digital first behavior. And that enables more opportunities. So mobile payments, an example of this. Why don't Chinese use credit cards? Because they never did that before. And when mobile phones came along, it just made more sense to do mobile payment. It's a better solution to this. But once you get mobile payment, then all those other things I just said become possible. So digital first consumers are resulting in superior infrastructure for this world, which then enables even more. The bicycles, the scooters, the lobsters. Um, it's a really interesting dynamic. We see better logistics and delivery. The fact that I can get something delivered in a day anywhere. We see better regulation that is very smart about the digital world. We see payment and credit. You can get, I can get credit approved for a purchase in under a second on my phone. They have micro credit. If I'm going to buy something online, I can, it can review me and approve me in like half a second and give me the money to buy something. So we're seeing financial services, payment, credit, physical stores, low cost labor, which is a lot of these, it's all in many ways better than what you'd see in New York. And you can do the same pattern in Indonesia, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and probably here. So it's kind of an interesting scenario. I think I broke it. Yeah, I think I broke it. Um, now nah, I busted it. I can go back, but not forward. Okay, final point on this is one, you have this interesting pattern of digital first behavior. You also have bigger problems. So there's more urgency to do all of this. You have more pollution, you have water safety issues, you have, you have massive congestion problems, you have corruption, you have crime. There's a lot more pressing needs. Um, pollution is a big problem in China. They've started to deploy drones that fly over factories and sniff the air. And suddenly they can find out who is quietly polluting late at night and they're getting huge reductions. Uh, they're having smart cities where the, the street lights are all run by AI in the whole city and congestion in the city drops by like 50%. So we're seeing, and then obviously security is a big thing. There's cameras everywhere. Um, does it work? What did I do? Um, okay. Basically, the first point is China's digital consumers are causing China, Asia, and a lot of countries to diverge from the path we've seen other countries take as they develop. They're doing something new. Okay, that's point one. Point two, kind of the big story for the last year is new retail. This is digitalization of shopping centers, grocery stores, convenience stores. Um, time this gets a lot of press it's really pretty fun uh, what new retail is really about it's about transforming the consumer experience it's making the old way of doing things almost obsolete and it also is changing how you compete as companies uh, which is kind of what we call platform strategy so this is kind of the one that everyone paid attention to alibaba in 2017 jack ma comes out and he says we're going to do new retail it's his not a very interesting term, really, new retail. It's kind of not terribly great as a name. <clears throat> but he basically said, we're going to merge the online and the physical assets. So the consumer is going to have one seamless experience that's data driven. And they started out doing supermarkets, mom and pop stores, convenience stores. I'll give you some examples. So if you go into the supermarkets, this is the new Alibaba supermarkets where there's no cash registers, right? You pay with your phone. Everything's on your phone. You walk in and you might go up to the lobster tank because seafood is very popular. You scan the, the little barcode with your phone and it will tell you, oh, these lobsters were caught three days ago 
off of the coast of whatever. It'll track the history of the food because food safety is a big concern. Um, you can order these now. You can have them delivered to your house within 30 minutes if you live within the radius. You can have them cooked in the store if you like. And while you're waiting for them cooked, you it'll say things like, oh, you're, you know, why don't you buy these other items and you can use this recipe that we recommend for you? And it'll suggest other things in the store to go get. Oh, and by the way, we know that your son has an allergy to this, so we recommend that you do that. Because by the way, they know everything about you. I don't know if they do the medical thing yet, but it's coming. And would you also like a movie to watch? Because by the way, we're Alibaba and we have all the digital entertainment. So as it's delivered to your home, cooked with everything, we, you can stream a movie. It's becoming like this ultimate consumer marketplace. So these stores, um, they're, what they're basically doing is they're combining a supermarket with a logistics hub with a service center. And basically 60, 70% of all their orders come from people who are not in the store at that moment. They're on their way home, they're in their office, and they're ordering on their phone. Because you, you can buy not only what's in the store, you can buy everything in the Alibaba ecosystem and have it all delivered. Um, the newest thing they've done is they put restaurants in and they have these little robot waiters. So you sit down at the restaurant, maybe you've ordered some food, they cook it for you, and then the little robot comes along down the thing. It's kind of a gimmick, but it's pretty fun. So they're starting to put robots in them. Um, skip through this. The other big competitor, Alibaba, is JD, which is a big e-commerce site. Um, what everyone's doing right now with this game of we're going to take retail and digitize it is they're all assembling the assets right now. We don't quite know the use cases yet, but we know the assets you need. So everyone is opening warehouses. Everyone is opening physical stores. Everyone is doing e-commerce sites. Um, so they're opening warehouses all over the place. They're building little robots of various types. This is the one that I think follows you automatically in the store as you walk through the supermarket. It just tracks you and, and comes behind you. Um, I think you still have to push it, but that's where they're going. And then you can, in, as they get their AI assistant better and better, like Alexa, you can talk to it. You know, would you like to buy something else today? Well, I'd like a bottle of wine. What do you think? Well, with this, what you're having, you should have this. And, you know, oh, by the way, we're plugged into your home and we know that your your milk is about to expire in three days because we can see in your fridge. It's getting creepy. Um, these are the robots for the warehouses that move around. This is the fire extinguisher robot for the warehouse. So one asset is kind of the, the robotics. One is the warehouses. The other asset people are sending is local delivery. And this is something we don't see in the US, but we see in developing countries, is you have a sort of lower cost labor population and you can do things like immediate delivery. So these guys deliver three times a day. Anything you need, you order it in the morning, you get it in the afternoon. They're super fun guys to hang out with. They're mostly, it's like 80% guys for this job. They're real fun to hang out with. Um, they have these autonomous vehicles that are starting to cruise business parks and college campuses where they, you order something, this little thing comes up to you, blah, 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 blah. You, you scan it with your phone, the door opens, you take your item, or it scans your face now. Like you can check in for the airport now with just your face. You just walk up and it scans you. Drones, I don't really know what they're doing with drones, but they're fun. This is the new drone, which is like a combination plane, rotor. Apparently it can go a long distance. I've asked if you can ride one of these and they said no. Like, cause they, <laughs> they can carry like a couple hundred pounds. So, was, you know, you're not allowed to ride them. These are the new convenience stores, which is basically nobody's there. You walk in, the door opens, it knows who you are. You take whatever you want. As you leave, it registers the sale, it dings your account. Um, that's JD's headquarters in Beijing. They're building two more of these buildings. They have 100 and about 60,000 employees. A year ago, they had like 120. Five years ago, they had 20,000. They've basically grown their revenue by a factor of 10 in five years. I mean, that's how big this is. Okay, so what's happening is if you merge the physical world with the online world for retail, in some cases, it completely changes the supermarket, like the experience, like these supermarkets. Now, imagine you're not one of those and you're a traditional supermarket. How do you compete with that? I mean, you can't, 
right? So certain businesses, it's a total transformation. You have to play that game. Other businesses, it turns out it's not that big a deal. Um, so this is Intersport. Does anybody know Intersport, German retailer? Uh, Nike shoes, Adidas shoes, a lot of sports apparel. Uh, they just opened this store in Beijing. Um, keep standing in front of people. Um, which basically is a new attempt at, at new retail. You walk in, the little camera sees you. As you walk up, it put it digitizes you and puts you on the screen. And anything you've looked, you've picked up, it knows and it puts it on you. You can see it, they're getting good where they can tell what you're looking at as you walk and what you're interested in. And anything in the catalog in the store or online, you can pick and see how it looks. You can change your stomach size. <laughs> you can figure out what that one's for. Um, that is not me, actually. They just took my head and stuck it on someone else's body. You can see like, like my neck. They're, they're still figuring it out. It's new. Um, you pick up a shoe. You can look at the mirror, and it'll show you what your foot looks like with the shoe on, give you information. I don't think it's totally transformative. I think apparel is interesting. I don't think it's as big of a game changer as, as supermarkets. This is the new hotel. This is the Alibaba hotel. This is check-in. There's no staff. You walk up, you scan your phone, you make your order online through their Expedia-like service. You walk up, it'll scan your face or your, your phone. You check in, get your key. You go into your room. Everything is controlled by like an Alexa. It's called Team All Genie, but it's like Alexa. You basically speak, please turn on the lights, please set my alarm, please put on some music. Play. And because it's Alibaba, anything, would you like to buy a movie? Well, they, they own all those. Would you like to listen to music? Would you like to buy some stuff online? Because by the way, we're Alibaba. Would you like to buy something from our supermarket down the street? It's all linked together. If you want to buy something, then this little thing they call the space egg comes down the hallway and opens and you take your food. That's sort of hotels. This is a lot of experimenting right now. People are just trying stuff, right? It's not clear if this is all going to work. Um, this is a furniture store in Beijing, which is Jingdong, JD. They're kind of experimenting with how families buy homes, and they buy their home, and they design all the furniture at the same time. Everything from the sofa to the plants to the pictures on the wall. You have chairs designed to fit you perfectly. You have your child's room designed as they want it. There's a lot of interesting stuff people are trying. Here's an example of one. This company just filed to go public in the US uh, last week. There are competitors, Starbucks. They want to digitize coffee. Um, it's not that interesting. You basically order on your phone. You can have it delivered, but it doesn't. On one extreme, there's supermarkets where the situation changes the whole experience. This one is pretty much the same. It's a little more convenient, but it's not transformative. So there's a spectrum here of where this works and where it doesn't. But it raises the question, if new retail is first, if retail is going first in this sort of grand experiment, you know, how you shop, how it changes, who's coming next? Is luxury shopping, apparel, handbags, fashion different when you combine the physical aspects with the online aspects seamlessly? I don't know. There's a lot of entertainment in this. There's a lot of emotion. You walked into the store. I don't know what that looks like. What about education? What is it when the schools, the online classes, the online teaching, the testing is combined with what you do within the school? Healthcare. So people think this is probably, these two are going to be very transformative. And Chinese parents spend more on private education than any group on the planet. Uh, so people think retail is sort of the first to go, but these two are probably going to be bigger. Luxury is a bit of a question mark. So this idea, they, they're starting to call it OMO, online merge offline, that the physical world and the digital world are becoming one. Um, okay. That's kind of the second point here. I'm not going to go into this. This is just for people who like strategy. The other thing that new retail really changes is how you compete as a company. It, I mean, it changes the game. 
these online creatures like Alibaba and Amazon really do change how you compete as a merchant or a brand. Uh, I put in a bunch of slides here. I'm not going to go through them of just how to think about competing in this world. Uh, it's a lot of strategy stuff. But I don't think it's relevant. But if you're curious, there it is. But that's kind of point new. New retail is a redefinition of the consumer experience and how you compete. Uh, point three, this is sort of a uniquely China thing, and this may actually be a Mexico story as well. We see innovation in digital everywhere, right? Every country you're going to see innovation in digital. In a handful of companies, we're also seeing innovation in manufacturing, and we're seeing those two things happen together. Uh, most of the hardware of the world comes from a couple places. Um, so, for example, uh, skip this. These bicycles that everybody talked about for a lot last, a lot of time last year. This was a this was an example of innovation in digital that you can rent a bicycle as you need it, with innovation in making bicycles. These are smart bikes, right? They put GPS in them. It makes sense that this would happen in China because that's where all the bicycles are made, most of them. Um, we're seeing combinations of like innovation on the hardware side and innovation in the digital side at the same time. We don't see that in Silicon Valley because Silicon Valley doesn't manufacture anything. They just do software and the interface. Uh, we're seeing both of these in Asia. This is CES, the big electronics showcase in Las Vegas a couple months ago, consumer electronics. Of the about 4,000 companies that were there, 1700 were american and about 13 to 1500 were chinese this is where everything's coming from the bicycles the refrigerators the handsets the robots um drones that's dji <coughs> smart washing machines uh, that operate on their own that are connected smart refrigerators i wasn't joking about the refrigerator that can tell like when your items are going to expire and what your levels are and automatically reorder um, the question is, if your refrigerator knows what you want and you walk in and you take a Coke, it automatically reorders the Coke. Like it's like it's like in a hotel, right? You take it, you come back later, the Coke's there again, and you got a bill. <laughs> like the argument is that's what's going to happen in homes. Um, they have to figure out how to get it into your house without freaking people out. Um, <laughs> but basically, it can track what's in your fridge, and as you order, you just take what you want and they may there may be a door in the back that goes out outside and someone can come up or there might be a locker outside i'm just going to let someone come in i'm like dude, dude just come on in and put it in and don't worry about it we'll put a camera up um robot you know, sort of personal assistance you see these in shopping malls in china now they sort of wander around may i help you they're kind of annoying right now um but you could have them for your home mobility smart cars autonomous vehicles. All of this hardware aspect is coming from Asia, most of it. Some here, but you know, it's a lot of an Asia story. So we're seeing innovation in the hardware and the, and the digital at the same time. This was a really fun sub, well, that's an, the best explanation I heard about these vehicles. I think it was, I think this is LG, was they said, stop thinking about it like a car. Um, Think about it like the, the room of your house that detaches and moves. Like you go and you sit in your sofa and you've got the TV. And as you're doing that and chatting, the how, that part of the house detaches and takes you where do you need to go. And then you get out. And you can set that space up like a desk, like it's your office. Or it could be a playroom or it could be a relaxing room because you're going out with friends. But that's how they kind of, it's like it's, a, it's a, a living space that just happens to move and takes you where you need to go. We'll see. It's all early days, but it's pretty fun. Oh, I put these in just for fun. These are some of the other stuff they had at CES. It's a really ugly Mercedes. I don't know. Um, I don't know what these are. I, have, I don't even know what that is. But all of this stuff, there's just a lot of interesting create. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, I think he goes through that hole in the rock. Like, I don't know. Uh, 
I don't know what that is. Uh, anyways, there's a whole lot going on on the hardware side that a lot of things that were traditionally just dumb, like toothbrushes. Now you go in the toothbrush people like it was Philips. It's a smart toothbrush with AI and it sees your teeth and it, as you brush and it connects with dentists in real time so they can see your teeth. Like everybody's like our, you know, like our forks are smart. Like it senses your food. Like everyone's talking this way. Who knows what it's going to end up? Um, oh, the, the funniest one, this is smart underwear. Uh, this is a real thing. It's clothes that senses, I don't know, perspiration or whatever. And I asked them, what's your biggest selling item? They said, oh, it's the smart underwear. I didn't really ask any more questions. I didn't want to know what that was about. Really. <laughs> but basically, it's this idea of digital innovation is happening everywhere. Digital innovation plus hardware innovation is an Asia story, and it's probably more of a Mexico story than other countries. And uh, U.S. is not very good at it. There's not a lot of, you know, there's some, but not like here. So I think that's a unique thing to keep an eye on. Uh, how are we doing? Last point. I've been talking for a while. Thirty-five. Okay. This last point, I'm not going to go into too much, but it is actually kind of important. Um, as you know, China is state capitalism, right? It's the government is actively involved in a lot of things, and the Chinese government is going all in on digital. Huge support, huge initiatives, stunningly big, and it's going to work. Like that's the short version. Um, a couple of years ago, the premier 2015 basically made a, a big announcement that China should go for mass entrepreneurship and mass innovation. Those are the phrases, mass, huge amount of support for developing innovation hubs in cities, in Beijing, in Shenzhen, a lot of support, tax incentives, educational incentives, uh, tax credits, uh, loans for land development that can be built into districts that support entrepreneurship. It's a big deal. Um, 2017, they launched a plan to become the world AI leader by 2030. Uh, huge support for this industry. An enormous number of people coming out of schools in computer science and machine learning. Like an example, and it happens at every level. Like it's federal, it's at the, the provincial level and the city level. So one example would be Tianjin, which is just east of Beijing on the water. Just this one city has a $5 billion fund for AI, and they've created an intelligence zone with a huge parcel of land to support companies doing this. That's just one city. You'll find this everywhere. It's, it's pretty impressive. There's a, a huge push into autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. China's already the number one maker of electric vehicles everywhere. <clears throat> Uh, it's the world's largest market, although it's pretty, it's still pretty small, so that doesn't necessarily mean that much. Um, and this is just their support all over the place. There's support for charging stations, for car registration, for loans. I mean, it's, it's just a long list of things that are supporting this industry. Um, one of the initiatives that is really interesting, and I think it's interesting for Mexico and Latin America, is there are about a thousand smart city projects in the world. The idea that we're going to digitize, we're going to put sensors everywhere, we're going to build AI, we're going to gather data, and we're going to have software run certain aspects of cities. About a thousand projects worldwide, 500 of them are in China. Um, it's very effective at certain things. It's very good at stopping crime. You cannot be a thief in Beijing. You will get caught. There are cameras everywhere. Uh, I can walk across Beijing at 2 a.m. with a laptop under each arm, and I don't think twice about it now. Nobody's going to do anything. Um, and so you see certain cities have, are the leaders in this. Alibaba, Ping'an, Tencent, and Huawei are leading these major initiatives to prototype and to experiment. Uh, Alibaba is one of the most impressive. They have a city thing they call City Brain, which was launched in 2016 in Hangzhou, which is where they're based, which is sort of just outside of Shanghai. Um, they basically have video footage everywhere. People all have phones so that they see an accident. People take pictures of it. That data comes in. 
the police all have cameras. All that data comes in, or the metro, the buses all have GPS, all that data comes in. The Uber-like company, DD, all that information comes in of where cars are. All that data comes in, and they can start to you know, change the stoplights. The, the street lights will shift based on what's happening. The street lanes can change direction. Uh, if there's a fire, first responders are given privileged access along certain routes where traffic is stopped for them. It's becoming dynamic. They were fifth in congestion for Chinese cities. Now they're 57th. It took care of that problem pretty fast. Um, 1,300 traffic lights are controlled by AI. 200 plus police are available at all times, LinkedIn. Uh, firefighting, rescue, emergency response. Um, it's starting to plan how this, now that's sort of like managing what you have. Now they're starting to plan the city going forward based on this. So they're, they're rerouting bus lines. They're planning new districts that don't look like regular cities. They look like cities designed to be smart from the beginning. All the traffic goes underground and people walk up on top and take scooters. So they're starting to redesign entire cities with the idea that these are going to be smart entities and they look different. Uh, so anyways, there's a lot more data here. I'm not going to go through it. But once you digitize, you get the data coming in, you have some sort of smart system watching it, you start to build apps on it, just like you would build apps on your smartphone. Once you have the operating system, you put apps. The apps that are really moving, um, security is a big one. It just is. You'll read about it in the paper all the time. Um, mobility is a big one. Energy and water are the big one. That's kind of where things are happening right now. But people think it'll go to healthcare, waste, economic, community engagement. We can see where it's going, but right now it's a lot of security, energy, water, and mobility apps. But once you get the operating system, it's just like having smartphones. All the developers can start making stuff that run on the city. Anyways, I'm not going to go through this, but it's pretty interesting. The difference here is the Chinese government actually is very good at executing rapidly and effectively at large scale. They've been doing it for 20 years. They have a lot of practice. Uh, they're very good at building cities in particular. Okay. Um, here's some traffic surveillance. That's me. <laughs> there's stuff now in Beijing where if you walk across the street, there's cameras and they have a big video screen and they show who's walking illegally. And they just kind of embarrass you. They put your picture up there of you crossing. And it does make, and they can, one, they can identify you if they want. Um, but they, you know, they're starting to do this or they just put up videos of traffic patterns and people see this and then they start to reroute on their own because they know these lanes are blocked. So there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, I'm not going to go through this. This is more about mobility, DD choosing. Last point. This is just fun stuff. <laughs> I'm right on time. Great. Last couple minutes. Okay, so those are kind of the main points. Digital first consumers are giving China and other developing economies digital first infrastructure, which really does matter. It's, it's a leapfrogging phenomenon. Two, this new retail, online, offline merging, it's a redefinition of the consumer experience. The big risk here is your competitors do this and you don't because these other supermarkets are in desperate trouble now. Nobody goes. You know, it's like being made obsolete. Uh, innovation in digital, which is a global thing, is combining with innovation in smart and connected hardware. Uh, the government of China is doubling down on digital. It's going to work. Okay, just some final stuff. Digital Asia, China, that's worth keeping an eye on this year. It's going to be fun. Uh, Elon Musk is coming to China. He opened a huge factory in Shanghai, $5 billion to build Teslas in China. Um, he was spotted in Beijing a couple months ago at a hot pot restaurant. Like, uh, it's just going to be fun watching him compete in China. We haven't had this much since uh, Uber. Travis Kalanick came to China a couple years ago and fought for the market. And it was, it was just a lot of fun. It's going to be a good story. Uh, he may succeed, he may not, but it'll be fun to watch him deal with China. Um, Didi is continuing to pummel Uber uh, in a lot of places. Uber is doing well in other places. Um, you know, Didi here is here in Mexico. 
right? Like Didi did real well in China. They merged up with Uber. And then they have partners in Southeast Asia. They have Grab and Ola in India. And they partnered up. But there's only, if you look at Uber's IPO prospectus, they have two major international markets. They have the US and then they have some smaller ones. But their two biggest ones, I think, are Brazil and Mexico outside of the US. Didi only operates in China. Uh, and then it has partners, but it has opened in two other countries directly, Brazil and Mexico. That's the only place they're operating directly. I don't know if that's a coincidence or what, but they're here in Mexico. They bought 99 in Brazil. So there is this ongoing competition. The net result is we all get discounted rides because they fight and subsidize and we all get discounts. So uh, that's fun to watch. This is DD in uh, Mexico City. This is really funny. Here's the Uber office. The DD office is right there. <laughs> it's half a block away. And every day, DD sends like eight to 12 people to stand in front of the Uber office to recruit their drivers. It's the funniest thing. They've been there every day for months. And the Uber drivers come in, and they have to kind of push through them. Uh, and they also put this truck. There's the Uber office. They put this big truck. <laughs> right next door as funny as anything um okay another story to keep an eye on these smart devices we talked about like smart refrigerators smart blenders smart toasters smart refrigerators they're doing very well internationally coming out of china and smartphones were the first like if you go across mexico you'll see huawei oppo i mean they're they're rocking and rolling they absolutely devastated india a couple years ago there's a great chart of like indian smartphone sales by indian manufacturers at the beginning of the year and it's like 70 percent indian manufacturers plus like samsung and apple at the end of the year it was 80 percent chinese smartphone makers samsung and apple they just rolled through them and we see this everywhere these smart devices like mobile um are just going across Asia, they're going across Africa. And it, the smartphones are first, but we'll see it next with tablets, um, refrigerators, that will all come. And the surprising part is the mobile apps that are popular in China are also following. So if you go back to the start of last year, about 10 of the top 100 apps at the Google store in India were Chinese. End of last year was 44. They're rocking the, as you know. Somehow the apps are following the um, the smartphones. So these companies like TikTok and all these, they're they're really doing well. But you should see other stuff like Xiaomi, Lenovo, Neo is these electric smart scooters. Uh, I saw some of them in Mexico City last week. Um, these devices are coming. And this is the last point. This is kind of the big political issue for China, U.S. One of them which is we are starting to see a fight for the full tech stack. It used to be like you had 5G, semiconductors, Internet of Things, operating systems, apps. And then there was some difference. Like in China, you would use Baidu. And outside of China, you might use Google. You might have WeChat. You might have WhatsApp. There was a little bit of a segmentation at the app level. It's looking more and more like it's all the way down. Like now you have Huawei oops, pushing 5G everywhere, right? And the U.S. is arguing against that for various reasons. You see Chinese companies making semiconductors now. They used to all buy Western semiconductors. It was like the biggest import to China was semiconductors, chips. Now we're seeing Alibaba. They're all doing their own chips. A GPS system, which is a Western system, now China is launching its own satellite system for location. IoT devices, operating systems. It looks like we're seeing two different technology stacks emerge. And we know what China is going to use, and we know what the US is going to use. We don't know what the rest of the world is going to choose. You go into places like Africa, they're putting in Huawei. Ecuador is putting in Huawei. Um, Germany, we don't know. I think Britain. So there's this, this it's, it's somewhat about politics. Um, People talk national security stuff, which is not my area. A lot of it's just a fight to be the standard, that businesses want to be the tech standard. Uh, and we're starting to see these two systems emerge. 
And um, it's interesting. I'm not sure how, if it's going to totally separate or if it's going to be both, but I think this is going to be a big story. And that's basically my points. Um, all the slides are right there. If you go to my site and just do writing, they're already up there. You can download them. Uh, that's a WeChat code, which is, uh, that's kind of how we do things in Asia. Everyone uses WeChat. Otherwise, you can reach me there. But that's basically my points. Um, I think we're going to do questions. Yeah. Who's ever is in charge of time? But yeah, that's basically, thank you for your attention. Um, I don't know. Si alguien tiene preguntas, ¿con quién quieren pasar? Todavía lo estamos digiriendo, ¿verdad? Right on time. Chip. Can I ask you questions? <laughs> There's not that many perks to being a professor. One of them is you can call on people. You can also give them quizzes. I'm sorry, you had a question? We're still kind of uh, in, in a, a bit of a state of shock, uh, but, uh, but I, I think you know the, this is, is certainly mind-boggling. Uh, but uh, in in Mexico at this at this point, we're uh, truly undergoing a, a a transformation. Some call it the fourth transformation, uh, but whatever it is, it is a a social movement that that is a fact uh, that, that we, we started to see uh, very clearly um, a, a couple of years ago. And uh, in my opinion, there there is no stopping it. Uh, what role do you see technology playing in, um, in social movement? Yeah. This is like, we've seen technology before, right? New technologies come along. This one I think is different. Like, and it's, it's because it's, it's basically software, it's data, right? One of the things it does that I don't think we've seen before is, is digital lowers the threshold for participation. Like you don't need to be, you know, if you want to sell something, let's say you want to be a retailer. It used to be you had to have some skills, you had to have a store, you had to have some capital. One of the things like a company like Alibaba does is it lowers the threshold for participation. Where a small couple, you know, a family in a small village, way away from the city, you don't have to be in the urban center, you don't have to have the skills, you don't have to have the capital. You can be in a small village up in the mountains and you can be a merchant and you can sell online and you can sell to everybody. So there's like, Alibaba calls it like inclusive, like innovation, that it's opening the, the playing field. Um, there are these things called Taobao villages, where Taobao is, is, is like Amazon uh, for China. One of them is called Taobao, one's called Tmall. They have these things called Taobao villages, which are just small little villages up in the hills, way away from the city center, where this, the residents start becoming online merchants, and maybe they make shoes and they sell them online and suddenly they can sell to the whole country. And you're right up there on the web page next to Walmart. And one of the things Alibaba focuses a lot on is providing tools that lower the threshold for participation so that anyone can do it. I mean, they're in the business of empowering small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, so it's interesting that uh, people can participate in social media in you in videos in e-commerce uh even if you're not in a major city and you're, you're you know the big hit of this last year was short video which was like people make videos up on their phones and they post them and huge views uh, the most popular ones are by people like in factories sitting there like this is how i make a thousand bolts an hour and someone will take a video of how they crank the thing and they'll put it up and, and everyone in the country watches them or farmers way out in the hills. This is how I run the plow. And these people have huge numbers of views and they used to be silent before, not silent, but they were, they were off the radar. So a lot of this is like, you can participate economically. You can participate in social media. You can participate in news communication. 
Um, and they're only able to do it because you have these platforms and because they now have smartphones with the very, the reason they're doing short videos is because of very limited memory. You know, these are, these are not iPhones, but it's enough to make a 15 second video. If you go on a company called TikTok, T-I-K-T-O-K, -T watch these videos. They're so addictive. You'll see like grandma's cooking noodles in their house in the hills of China. And it's fascinating. And then you see construction workers sitting up late at night on the top of a skyscraper and it's just amazing they're totally addictive like you watch for like an hour um yeah it's very popular now so i don't know it's there's something about this like i don't know the social aspects terribly well but there's something that's very democratizing about digital technology in a way that other tech maybe wasn't um you see these villages like in Philippines starting to make stuff and suddenly they can go on Alibaba and they can sell to the whole world. They have contracting, they have logistics, they have payment, they can get credit. Um, my web page, which is not good, was done by someone in Sri Lanka that I just did online. So there's something powerful about that. Sorry. Can I just yeah. Uh, the... the the, the informal economy in Mexico is huge. Uh, people don't have bank accounts. People are not taxpayers. Yep. Uh, people don't have credit cards, so they can't use Uber. Uh, uh, but something you said that, 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 that really uh, uh, was very impressive to me is the fact that it's easier to get somebody to pay with their phone if they have never owned a credit card. Right. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, if you go to Africa, East Africa, there's a big unbanked population. They don't have, not only don't have credit cards, they don't have bank accounts, right? And then there's M-Pesa, which is a payment system started by the telco operator. And suddenly everyone walking around has a little cheap smartphone, usually made in China, and they can all send money to each other. And suddenly they're in the system. Um, and once they're in the system, one, you can sell to them, which is nice, but they can also transfer money to each other. And um, we see that in a lot of places. It's um, one of the interesting effects of that is, is um, it appears to be a good tool to go after corruption. If you digitize payments in a country uh, and you have AI searching the system, it's very hard for corruption to exist. The AI is very good at spotting it. That's what's starting to happen in China now is they have these systems that are scanning the banks and the payment networks and starting to sort of send notes to government officials. By the way, we kind of noticed what you did there and people are stopping, maybe. So it has all these interesting effects. Yeah, which I hear then, yeah. Okay, uh, question goes uh, pretty much along the, the same lines. Uh, probably you have witnessed son. there we go. Probably you have witnessed uh, the transformation uh, because Mexico suffers as well from the lack of a rule of law. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and generally speaking, people steal, uh, uh, burglarizes people in the streets and uh, steal cars and hijacks. Uh, and, and there is a number of issues that are going yeah. on. And and having all of this technology available, I, I believe China was the same. Not, not many years ago in some aspects. It, it's always been a pretty safe country. Um, it did, it's a very effective at policing, but definitely things have ramped up dramatically with digital. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question because like if I was in Germany talking, people would be asking me about surveillance and privacy. Yeah. That would be the question. What do you think about privacy? If I was in Brazil, everyone would be like, how can we get more surveillance, please? Mm -hmm. Like I've done this in Brio, like who's been robbed this year and half the room hands in the room go up. And if you say, look, we can put cameras and China systems are somewhat being exported now. We can put cameras all around Rio and that with facial identification, which makes it more or less impossible to be a thief. Sure. Would they go for it? Yeah, they probably would. You go to Germany and no, they want to talk about this. So there's this idea of like, there's a lot of digital. We talked about this last night at dinner, like, People are really concerned about surveillance because it has a lot of negative aspects. But for many situations, it's an improvement. Yeah. And that's a, it's an interesting trade-off. Um, yeah, but definitely like 
the digital thing appears to be incredibly effective at wiping out crime. You got GPS on the car. I got GPS on the bicycle. You got cameras everywhere. They can identify you perfectly. And there's a database and they know who you are. You know, that if you're willing to accept that, it's it really does work. Um, so that's kind of a question. And you can apply it to crime and you can also maybe apply it to corruption. That's kind of the next question. The stuff that happens behind the scenes, not on the streets, right? Um, and I think that's a question for the country then. Do you want to sign up for that system? Some big trade-offs. You want to build that in a city. You can now. Now, China, it's just the way it is. If I go through Beijing, there's cameras everywhere. Every time I go into the subway, my, bag, my bags are scanned. And they've got not just x-ray, but now they've got uh, machine vision, computer vision that can identify what's in my bag automatically. So you know, that system exists pretty much now. Does Mexico want to sign up? The certain cities maybe are willing to say, yes, we would do it as a city. Yeah, it's an interesting trade-off. I got robbed so many times, like in Brazil. I was like, yeah, do I need, please just sign me up. Like, tired of getting robbed. Um, okay. It, there are definitely like, here, here's one of the questions I do think about, is so much of certain country situations are about intractable, intractable problems that have always existed. And there's just no way to solve them. The tech may be emerging now that a lot of those intract some of those intractable problems now can be solved for the first time. I think that's happening. Um, not all of them, maybe some of them can't, but I think some of them can now. So we'll see. Yeah. Hello, Jeff. Thank yeah. you for for this informative session. I just I just have a couple of statements and a question at the end. So, firstly, you've been talking a lot about China. I'm from India. Ah, there you go. <laughs> um, I work for a Mexican company. Right. We are in Mexico now. Uh, and I'm British national. So, so they say, I mean, they've been, they've been talking a lot about how Facebook was a threat to democracy in, in England and how Brexit was a whole mess and is a mess because of the digital world. Uh, China, 1.3 billion people. India, 1.2 billion. Right. Uh, Mexico, 120 million. So India is 10 times bigger than Mexico, and 11 times uh, is China. So are you saying that whatever you you spoke about now, it, it, it in some way is going to happen in Mexico? Or if it's going to happen in Mexico, what is the time frame we are looking at, or we yeah. as companies, where are we in, yeah. in, in, in that race? What, what I like about this space. whole subject and is it is so much a developing economy story. Things are happening faster. If you go to Indonesia or Vietnam, things are really moving, um, I think, faster than in the West. So it's so much of digital is a developing economy story. And that's not typically how technology stories have been. It's been like sort of developing economies have the best tech. It's very expensive. This one, no, it's, it's different. Um, I mean, China is a, a first mover. They're very fast. Uh, Southeast Asia is where a lot of people are focusing right now. Uh, India, I don't know a lot about. Um, you know, it's there's always like the last year was really exciting. And then there were a couple of rulings that came out recently against Walmart and TikTok, the company I just mentioned, just got banned in India like a week ago, even though it was like 200 million users or something crazy. So there always seems like this one step forward, one step back. And I don't really have a good read on that. Um, what's a, Rwanda? Like I think it's Rwanda is really moving on digital. Uh, it's almost like country by country. Like it's certain countries just put the pieces together and start to move. Um, and within that, I would, on the short list, I would be looking at Mexico as a place that could break out and really start to move. Uh, I think Southeast Asia is on my short list. Uh, India, I don't understand enough. Certain places in Eastern Europe. Um, but you got to have sort of the pieces right, right? Like it's, I asked, I asked Alibaba this question like the 
the president of Alibaba. Like, how do you determine where to go internationally? Like, what are your criteria? And he kind of said they look at the rate of e-commerce development in a country. Because sometimes you have these big populations like India, but the e-commerce penetration rate is like 3%. Meanwhile, like China's at 25%. Like, so of, of retail in China, all of it, 25% is online now, which is very high. US is like 20%. I think India is still quite 3%. So it's like, yeah, the market's big, but it seems to be moving slower. Uh, there's this company, Mercado Libre, out of Argentina, right? That company was founded the same year as Alibaba. And Alibaba is like $500 billion company. So it, this rate of, economic, of sort of e-commerce development seems to be the biggest factor. That's what I would look at. Like where in Mexico is, e, what is the e-commerce e sort of development rate, which is a combination of regulations, online, payments uh, and consumer behavior, right? You got to have all the pieces going. Uh, I'm not sure how fast it is here, but I'd be looking at it. Uh, Chile seems to be moving pretty good, I think. Um, yeah, that was his answer because I don't, I, I'm not really a country analyst, right? It's not my thing, uh, but that's kind of what he said to think about. Good, maybe it happens at the city level. Maybe it's not a countrywide thing. Maybe it's one state really puts the pieces together with delivery and payment and you know that's enough you could do the security way security aspect that way if one city really just said look we're going to put cameras everywhere you know the government the local government says we're going to do it maybe that's how it goes yeah, it's a good question maybe mchem can facilitate a, a session about what's happening in mexico because that will help yeah. What are we doing on time? Okay. I have some questions for you, if you like. Um, just out of sort of a curiosity, like what percentage, raise your hand if you're on the manufacturing side of the business world. Okay, some. Retail? Uh, no retailers. What are other people in? I'm, I'm curious, like uh, financial services, banking, insurance, IT solutions, IT services, solutions, management, consulting, professional services, lawyers. OK, so pretty good mix. Uh, I mean, what would be sort of like of all of this, which is a big list, what digital sort of tool or aspect strikes you as the most important? like, or the most useful for sort of your world today? Does anything jump off the list as, you know, pay mobile payments are what we're going after or um, CRM, customer relations, or what would be on the short list of, of things that might, uh, might happen in the next year or so? Anybody, I'm just curious if anyone's thinking about initiatives in this regard. Logistics, like what kind of logistics? Where, uh, where, the trucks are. where our trucks are on the way to deliver our products to the clients. Okay. And what about customer relations? You said like, uh, yeah, I asked, uh, I asked Ali. We use, well, uh, this time we use WhatsApp. So uh, at this, uh, I had to stand, to stand up uh, from the table uh, in order to answer my customer how is their order going and you know yeah i asked alibaba like what was your priority like with ai and which is just software right and they basically said the exact same thing they said oh we're putting into everything i said no no what's your biggest priority and they said logistics and consumer relations that's it like one because the logistics are getting really complicated and two like well, because they're on the e-commerce side, that you can really be dynamic on the consumer relations side. You can show different people different things. You can interact with them differently. Uh, when I asked JD, Jing Dong, the same question, they said customer service. They said their biggest problem is they can't hire enough people to take the phone calls. And that the CTO was focused on, we've got to figure out how to automate customer service because we literally cannot hire enough people anymore. And so they're trying to build these bots that answer your questions and um, 
But yeah, they basically both said logistics was their biggest near-term opportunity. Uh, I think it was Jingdong because I mean, China is so big. They basically said it's so complicated, no human can do it anymore. Like the moving of all the packages all over the country and stocking all the warehouses with various items based on what anticipated orders will come in in the next 24 hours because everything is delivered in 24 hours. He basically says no human can do it. That the only the computer can do it now. Um, yeah. Okay, logistics customers. Anyone else? Digital signing. <laughs> Digital signage, yeah. like marketing or? In, I think the next big thing here in Mexico is there's new regulations for having everything signed digitally with legal binding. Oh, that's interesting. So, so I, I believe this will be something very important. Uh, not only in Mexico, but in all the region. Right. Uh, we, well, we, we have had many projects with companies trying to change the way they will deal with clients. Would it, be, would it be like legal documents or just standard little, I've bought something and I've got to digitally sign for it? Or is it more legal docs? Anything from contracts to, to, to payroll documents. To yeah, like anything. accounting and all that? Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, there's new re regulations that will allow this to happen very hmm. uh, well protected by those Yeah, there's really a lot of interesting stuff on just getting rid of scut work, like just basic stuff you don't have to do anymore that we all used to do like all the time. Yes. And now it's, it's kind of happens on its own. Okay. Hey, Jeff, I think we have to wrap it up. Okay. Any more? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not, I mean, employment in China tracks manufacturing, it tracks construction. I mean, like a quarter of the population is related to like construction and stuff. So it's, it's kind of a small um, segment of the population overall right now. But yeah, this is obviously like the subject everyone talks about is how does all this affect jobs? And the standard answer I hear, which I don't know because I'm not an economist, is employment itself doesn't change overall, but what we all do is going to change. Like job titles versus what you, it seems like what we're all going to spend our days doing is going to change very significantly, very quickly. Doesn't necessarily mean people are going to be unemployed. Um, but yeah, it seems to be a shift. Like retail clerks, you know, people who stand at these checkout counters. The, you know, one of the biggest employers in the United States is, is um, truck driving in every state. Like the biggest, the most common job is truck driving and the trucks are pretty good at driving themselves now. Like it's pretty close. So yeah, I think the shift is going to be pretty huge. Uh, what I, I, I basically tell people is like, be flexible, don't owe any money. Like, <laughs> you know, get ready if you have to move. Just one last comment. I, I, I live in China. For a couple of years, 2008. Where did you live? In Shanghai and then in Beijing. <laughs> I attended Tsinghua University. Ah, it's up the street. Yeah. Uh, and when I was in China, it was a non technological China. Yeah. And I went back in 2014 and it was a different China with not that technology. My brother went last year to China and told me it was the most technological country he has seen in the world. But it wasn't for me. For me, it was, I got my bike stolen like 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a different thing and it's gone so quickly. It's, it's, it's a new thing. Like if you, had, if you had polled people in China in 2009 or 10, who, who's online? Okay, a big portion of the population was online. But if you ask them, how many years have you been online? Like 70% have been online for under two years. It was a totally new thing. Yes. And so then you got to think, okay, now look at where we are. We take people from like Italy and we bring them to China on, for fun because it's fun for me. We take away their money and their wallets and we give them smartphones and we send them out in Beijing with a list of things to do with no cash. And they have to use their phones. And they come back and they're stunned. Uh, that's just 10 years. Think of where we're going to be 10 years from now. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really, yeah. It's, it's crazy. The bike, I never got my bike stolen used to make me mad. 
is my apartment, people would come up behind your apartment and they'd break into your wiring and they'd charge their mopeds. So you come up behind your apartment and you see people's bikes lined up tapping your electricity and you get billed and we have to keep pulling them off. Okay, good. All right, if you have any more questions, please stay after, but it's, it's been a real pleasure. And if I can ever be of help to anyone, don't hesitate to call. Um, you know, it's, it's really been a, a nice day to come here. So anyways, good luck with everybody. Thank you very much, Professor, for your very interesting uh, presentation. I would ask uh, Paco Ponton, our board director, Francisco Ponton, to please come and join me. Please, Professor, come forward to present you a certificate of appreciation. Y Patricio González, por favor, también como patrocinador. Thank you again for joining us, Professor Thompson. Gracias a todos. Estén pendientes de recibir las invitaciones a nuestros eventos. Les encargamos, si no se han registrado para el evento de mayo 3, que es el próximo viernes, no dejen de hacerlo, ya quedan pocos lugares. Y por favor, devolver sus gafetes a la salida para la, el, el reuso. Que tengan muy buen día, feliz fin de semana.